Ken Landau, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Bactrim. Bactrim is a combination antibiotic. It combines two different drugs. One is a sulfur drug known as sulfamethoxazole, and the other is another antibiotic known as trimethoprim combination, often simply referred to by initials TMPSMX or cotrimazole, or more formally, it's called trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Now, it's mixed together so that there's one part of trimethoprim to 20 parts of the sulfamethoxazole because that supposedly gives the best concentration in the body to fight bacteria. So we have two strengths. We have a strength where there's 40 milligrams of the trimethoprim and 200 milligrams of the sulfamethoxazole or the double strength where you have 80 milligrams of the trimethoprim and 400 milligrams of the sulfa drug. But the question is, is the combination really substantially better than just taking one of the drugs, the trimethoprim. And the reason that that's an issue is because there is a significant incidence of allergy to the sulfa component. So in a lot of countries, they're now restricting its use to those conditions where there is a demonstrated benefit where the trimethoprim alone can't do its job. The major indication for the drug is urinary tract infections. And in urinary tract infections, just like everywhere else, the combination is typically used, but but now the thought is, well, the trimethoprim probably is as good and you don't need to take the combination. It's used for skin and soft tissue infections. It's good for staph and especially good for the methicillin resistant staph that you hear so much about. It's good for respiratory tract infections where certain forms of the strep pneumonia or haemophilus influenza are the bacterial causes, but there's increasing resistance and it's good for people who have the pneumocystis pneumonia or toxoplasma pneumonia that's common in HIV or AIDS infected individuals. The package insert says that it's okay for middle ear infections, but it shouldn't be the first choice because we do have too many of the resistant strep pneumonia and haemophilus influenza. And as far as traveler's diarrhea is concerned, it used to be a mainstay for preventing it, but now it's thought that you really shouldn't take a drug to prevent traveler's diarrhea because it's going to change your intestinal flora and it doesn't work nearly as well, say, as a fluoroquinolone or some other kind of antibiotic. Now, again, we go back to the E. coli. It seems that if you happen to have traveler's diarrhea and it's caused by a form of E. coli known as the enterotoxigenic E. coli, well, then it's probably good. On the other hand, if you have a different form of E. coli known as the enterohemorrhagic E. coli, where you have some bloody diarrhea, and watery diarrhea, well, maybe it's not such a great antibiotic to take. It's also good for cyclospora. It's sometimes used for people who have cholera. And the drug itself seems to have a wide array of organisms that it can potentially fight the gram-positive and the gram-negative organisms. It treats the aerobes, but not the anaerobes, not the bugs that you would get if you have a burst appendix or if you have a problem with diverticulitis. It's not good against those particular organisms, nor is it good against fungi or viruses. It's good against some staph and strep, some salmonella and some shigella, good for some chlamydia and some H flu, even good for some Legionnaire's disease or Legionella. Now, it's important to realize that the antibiotics are not good for common colds. They're not good for viral illnesses. And the susceptibility of the kind of bacteria that might be sensitive varies from country to country, even from region of country to region of country. So we have resistance, resistance in organisms like the mycoplasma or the pseudomonas aeruginosa. Those are very common organisms that are causing significant amount of mischief nowadays, especially in the lungs, especially in the kidney. You should not take the drug if you happen to be pregnant in the first trimester and 
if you take the drug, it can lead to spinal deformities, it can lead to cardiovascular problems, it can lead to malformations of the urinary tract, and near the end of pregnancy, it can cause preterm birth, it can cause a baby to have low birth weight, and it can cause an accumulation of bilirubin, that's the color that makes it a pigment that makes you turn yellow, and in newborns, it's called kernicterus, and that can lead to substantial brain disorder. It's because the sulfa pushes the bilirubin off of its binding sites. If a woman is breastfeeding, probably shouldn't take the drug. And we don't use the drug for children who are less than, say, about two months of age or thereabout. In the elderly individuals, the clearance from the body is slightly reduced, so we have to be careful, especially if there's liver or kidney disease. Well, side effects. Side effects are always an issue with antibiotics or with any other kind of drug, and the standard ones apply here, itching, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It's an antibiotic, so it can change the bacteria in your intestinal system, and if you kill too many of the good bugs, you can let some bad bugs like Clostridium difficile overgrow, and if you have Clostridium difficile overgrowing, that might cause mild diarrhea, moderate diarrhea, or it can progress to such severe diarrhea that it can be responsible for death. And about 30,000 people die every year of Clostridium uh, diarrhea in the United States. It can cause some problems with the liver, either mild elevation of the liver function test or a chemical hepatitis, or it can go on to cause a fulminant liver failure and death. It can interfere with the bone marrow, interfere with the production of the red blood cells, lead to an aplastic anemia, or it can lead to agranulocytosis when it interferes with certain type of white blood cells. It can cause pains in your joints, arthralgias, or drug-induced lupus, and sometimes it can lead to serum sickness and hypersensitivity reactions are not uncommon with sulfa component hypersensitivity reactions where you get inflammation in the lungs or the kidney or the pancreas and you have problems with a severe rash, you get short of breath. Well, rashes are common with this drug. And for the most part, the rashes are not very important, but sometimes they're the harbinger of more severe problems, problems that we call Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis, where basically the skin just seems to fall off, and it does that even especially more so in people who are infected with the HIV virus. In those people, not only do they get the rash, but the potassium goes up, the sodium goes down, they become febrile, they have a low white count, and they have some impairment of the liver function, so that's all very important. And in people who might be deficient in folic acid, it's important not to use the drug because the drug prevents the manufacture of folic acid. So people who happen to be chronic alcoholic, people who are malnourished, people who have malabsorption, and also, interestingly, people who have allergies. So people who have severe bronchial asthma probably shouldn't take the medicine. And the drug seems to interfere or interact with an awful lot of other kind of drugs. So it interferes with the diuretics at times. It interferes sometimes with the ACE inhibitors used for blood pressure control, or amiodarone. It interferes with warfarin, the drug that's used commonly as a blood thinner. It interferes with the drugs in the sulfonylurea class, the glipizide and glimepiride, that are used to lower the blood sugar in diabetics. It can interfere with spironolactone metabolism or dapsone or even the drug known as methotrexate that's commonly used to treat arthritis or treat psoriasis or treat certain forms of cancer. And you have to be careful if you take the drug. If you happen to have thyroid disease or kidney or liver disease, if you happen to be elderly, as I mentioned, if you're an alcoholic, if you have a G6PD deficiency that you inherit that might be as high as 20% of people with African heritage or if you're taking certain kind of anticonvulsants. And if we look at the death rate, the death rate seems to be about four in a million people die from the antibiotic on a course of therapy. But fortunately, it seems to be restricted. So if we look at overall, you have to be taking the drug typically for about two weeks before you have this sort of problem. It's unusual in people who are younger than age 70. Well, 
the drug fortunately seems to be widely distributed. It's widely distributed throughout the body. It goes into the sputum, it goes into the middle ear, it goes into the bronchial secretions and the prostate and the vaginal secretions, it goes into the bile, it crosses the placenta, so that's a, an issue. It even crosses through the uninflamed meninges, so some of it gets into the brain. It peaks at about one to four hours after you take it. The half-life in adults is about 15 hours for both components, the sulfur methoxazole and the trimethoprim. On the other hand, in children, there's more rapid elimination. So the sulfa is out in, with a half-life of about 10 hours, and the trimethoprim out in, with a half-life of about five hours. The sulfa is about 70% bound, so that means 30% is unbound. It's the unbound fraction that's very important. But interestingly, the sulfa displaces the trimethoprim from its binding site, so you even get more of the free trimethoprim floating around. About 60% of the trimethoprim is free. Well, both are metabolized in the liver. They're eliminated through the kidney. If you have normal renal function, about 50 to 80 or 90 percent of the sulfa component is going to go out in the urine. About 50 to 70 percent of the trimethoprim is going to go out in the urine. And we're going to have some amount in the bile and some amount in the fecal tissue. But the question again goes right back to, do you really need the combination? If we look at the tissue concentration of the drugs, it seems like the tissue concentration of the trimethoprim is higher than the sulfa, and that again brings up that question. Now, the combination can interfere with other kind of tests, with laboratory tests, tests of kidney function especially. The way the drug works is it inhibits the bacterial manufacture of folic acid. And obviously the folic acid is important to manufacture the DNA. The whole concept of the sulfa drugs began at the Bayer Company, the Bayer Aspirin Company, way back in Germany in 1932 when they came up with a chemical known as protonsil. Now this drug was a derivative of a coal tar dye. And, and it was used in the industry where it was used as a, a pigment. And interestingly, over time, when these researchers were working, they found that it seemed to be active against certain kinds of parasites and certain kinds of bacteria. But when the medicine was used in the laboratory, it didn't seem to be effective. It was only when they put it in animals that it seemed to be effective because it was a prodrug. It had to be converted into the sulfonylamide. And when it was converted into the sulfonylamide, it seemed to be very uh, handy because it latched on to the bacteria and especially latched on to strep. And remember, up until that time, we didn't have any good kind of antibiotics that would treat strep infections. Penicillin had not yet been invented, but unfortunately there was significant toxicity. And over the next several decades, they had about 5,400 different variations of the molecule. And unfortunately, some of them precipitated in the kidney and led to kidney stones. And uh, sometime thereafter, in the late 1930s, about 100 people died when an elixir was made with the sulfonylamide when they used some diethylene glycol, that's basically antifreeze, and that led to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. The trimethoprim didn't come into existence until about 1962. And it seems that the trimethoprim is about 20 to 100 times more active than the sulfa. Well, then that brings up the question again. Do we really need the sulfa or is the trimethoprim by itself okay? Well, both of the drugs, either the trimethoprim or the sulfa methoxazole, they're bacteriostatic. They wound the bacteria, they prevent the bacteria from growing so that the body's immune system can hopefully handle it. Together, sometimes they can be bactericidal and actually kill the bacteria, but typically they don't do that. So the question is, what happens now that we're seeing an increasing amount of resistance, both in the urinary tract and in the respiratory tract and in the GI infections? Widespread, oftentimes, resistance, so that if we look in different parts of the world, 
when we look at, the, let's say, gastrointestinal infections, we find that the rate of resistance can be from as low as 5% to greater than 50% of the organisms. So if we look at the standard kind of organisms that cause problems with the GI tract, Salmonella, Shigella, and the Vibrio, and the enterotoxigenic E. coli, well, in one experiment, on day two, they looked at the clearance of the bacteria from the intestine. If you took a placebo, about a quarter of the time, the bacteria were gone. If you took the combination, the TMP-SMX, well, on day two, about 40% of the time, the bugs were gone. But if you took a relative of the fluoroquinolins, that's like Cipro or Levoquin, in this case, they happen to use Norfloxin, the rate of clearance was about 90%. Now, in 1969 or thereabout, it was thought that the combination really was, that was what you wanted. It seemed that the combination worked better than either drug alone. But that was followed by some investigation so that, especially within the United Kingdom over in England, by 1980, they suggested, hey, use one drug or the other. Don't use the combination, especially if you happen to be elderly, especially if you happen to have other kind of issues. And then everybody, hey, just take the single drug and don't use the combination unless there's a reason to believe that the combination is going to work much better. And by the way, when we're talking about the antibiotics, even though it's a sulfa drug, it's unrelated to sulfate or sulfite that you might find in food or you might find in wine. The dose of the medication, if you have an uncomplicated urinary tract infection, three days is as good as either five or 10 days. And actually, a single dose is only slightly less effective than taking it for three days. Now, if you have a complicated infection, then you need to take it longer. If you have prostatitis, you need to take it longer. And you have to consider the resistance pattern in the area where you live. So if the organism's, say, greater than 20% resistant, then this isn't the drug for you. The good news about the drug is the drug is very inexpensive at the present time. So for less than $20, you can get a course of therapy of either the combination drug or the trimethoprim by itself. So as with all antibiotics, it's important to use them with care. Don't abuse them. Don't take them for colds. Don't take them for sore throats. And consider that you just take the trimethoprim. You might not even need the sulfa. And if you don't take the sulfa, you might reduce your risk of having a variety of side effects. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you found the show enjoyable, well, maybe you subscribe, even tell a friend. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.